Good morning again. Man, it is good to see you all. Everybody's all bundled up. We know the winter is finally here. Got to dust off that snow shovel. <laughs> it's actually here. Uh, I hope this is, hope you guys have enjoyed yourself so far. My name is Scott Matthews. I'm the campus pastor. And if this is your first time here, we hope you feel welcome and we hope you feel at home here at River Oaks in Elkhart. Uh, we are a church, we're just trying our best to reach all people. Our, our hope is a church to be down here. We're here for a reason. We want to be a church that reaches, doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what your income level is, doesn't matter the color of your skin, doesn't matter what language you speak. If Christ has made you in his image, we want to reach you for Jesus. We know if, if, if whoever you are, that we can, we can come together under the name of Jesus Christ and what he taught. Amen? So important to remember that. And here we are, this first week of 2024. You made it. Look at that. You made it, right? Man, all that scratching and screaming we were doing through 2023, here you are the first week. Now, maybe 2024 has already gotten a little crazy for you this first week, but that's okay. My hope is that you allow God to walk with you each and every step of the way throughout this year. And with a new year comes a new series, and we are going to jump into the book of Mark. So every week, I want you guys to bring your Bible, bring your highlighter. We're going we're gonna to surf through the scriptures in the gospel of Mark, and we're going to see what, what Jesus' life consisted of in this gospel. And gospel means good news. That word evangelion, that's what that is in the, in the original Greek. It means to, to proclaim good tidings. The good news that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And the first Four books of the New Testament are what we call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and Mark is one of these. And so the Bible is consisted of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It goes from Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament and from Matthew to Revelations in the New. And the first four books of that New Testament is Jesus' life. All the things that he set out to do is what we call the Gospels. And, and Mark is, interestingly enough, one of the very first ones who wrote. Out of the four, he's the first one who wrote uh, this biography of Jesus' life. And we see this here as, as it's all played out. Now, these four guys, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't all sit down and figure out what they were going to talk about with Jesus. They, actually, they didn't do that. They actually all wrote at different times. The Bible's actually amazing that, that over 40 authors in over 1,600 years, people wrote the same consistent idea that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we're going to see that as we unpack this gospel. Mark's gospel really isn't so much a biography of Jesus. It's really more like his accounts. It's more like his achievements. Because Mark wanted to prove to his listeners that Jesus was the Messiah. He is who he said he is. It's interesting, too. Mark was not one of the original 12. Mark wasn't, and neither was Luke. Neither one of them were the original. Matthew and John were. Mark was actually a guy, John Mark, what they called him, he was one of the original followers of Jesus after he left in the early church. Mark's mother uh, in her home, a church met in her home. And in that church, those were the people who prayed for Peter to get out of prison in Acts chapter 12. So Mark was very, uh, very close to the development of the early church. Mark was also uh, the cousin of Barnabas. And Mark went on a missionary trip with Barnabas and Paul and as he went with them, he was actually the reason that they split up because Mark deserted Barnabas and Paul. And, and Paul was like, I ain't taking that dude with me no more. That's a wrap. So, so, Barnabas, oh, so Paul and Barnabas, they, they leave John Mark. But John Mark actually starts to become close with a guy named Peter, with Peter, Jesus' disciple. And the church record tells us that much of the gospel of Mark, Mark got from interviews and sermons from Peter. He spent time with Peter. And we see that. So the stories in this gospel that he writes down, they move quick. It's like a movie. It's like a Netflix series, a movie. The things just move quick. Mark focuses so much on the miracles that he wants to prove that Jesus is God. He wants his readers to know that Jesus is who he says he is. This gospel is actually a letter that circulated throughout the Roman Empire. Because if you know this, the first century Rome was one of the worst places to be if you were a Christian or, or a Jew. First century Rome was the epicenter of, of Christian persecution. Right? It, it's so, so much happened. The church record tells us that, that Peter was crucified upside down, martyred for his faith. 
The apostle Paul, he, he was beheaded because of his faith. So, so many people lost their lives as a result of their belief in Jesus. So, so the Holy Spirit had to encourage these people. And people like John, Mark, and others wrote letters to the church to encourage them to stay faithful in the midst of suffering. E- even if your life depended on it, stay faithful to Jesus. And because of letters like this and because of the Holy Spirit, the people in the early church were able to look death in the face and stand still knowing that Jesus Christ was their Lord and Savior. Guys, you got to understand this. No matter how strong of a believer you are, there will be times you will need encouragement to stay in the fight. There will be times you will need encouragement to stay strong and to stay faithful and to never give up. Right? That, that, that's what we need to know. It, you might not be facing the opportunity to get your head chopped off like these guys were, but it might feel like your faith is getting beat up. It might feel like you're not winning in this season of your life. It might feel like every time you take one step forward, you're taking three steps back, but we trust that God is going to be with us through every step of our lives. That, that, that one day he is going to set up a kingdom. He tried to tell the people that's even greater than Rome, greater than in the United States, anything we, greater than we've ever seen. And as a follower of Jesus in his kingdom, we can make it through any situation. So I want to pray before we, before we hop into this so that God's work can just sit on our hearts. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I pray that as we open up your word, that we just hear what you have to say. The entrance of your word gives light. And God, I ask that as we read this word, as we, as we surf the pages of Scripture, help our hearts to hear what only you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. We're going to hop right into it. Mark 1 verse 1 says this. This is the good news, the, the gospel about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including the people of Jerusalem, they flocked, they went out there to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. So Mark is writing to the persecuted Christians in Rome. Some of them were were Roman believers, some of them were Jews, but, but Mark is writing to them. And right out of the gate in this gospel, he's reminding them that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the king. He's the one we've been looking for. Right out of the gate, he tells us that. Make no mistake about it. This man is who he said he is. And and, and as Mark, what he does, he only uses one Old Testament prophecy to prove it. Many of the New Testament writers, they were Jewish guys. And to prove that Jesus is who he said he was, they would tie it back to an Old Testament prophecy. Mark only uses one. And interestingly, the prophecy he uses isn't about Jesus. It's about the guy who's going to come before Jesus. It's about the forerunner, John the Baptist, the guy who's going to be the opening act and set the stage. John the Baptist got everything prepared for the people to hear Jesus. John called people to repentance and baptized them after they changed their life. Now, he was the forerunner. It's kind of like when you're, when you're at you know, the restaurant and you're starving, you know, just stomach is growling, and they finally bring you the appetizer. To finally settle your stomach down, to, to get your taste buds ready. I know, I know you're thinking about eating already. It's my bad. Right? So here it is, right? So, so, so John the Baptist was kind of like that appetizer. He got everything ready, got everything prepared. Anytime you go to a performance, what do they do? They have an opening act. The opening act is there to get the crowd warmed up, to get everybody ready. The Old Testament prophesied that there would be an appetizer, that there would be an opening act. And somebody would prepare the way for Jesus, the Messiah, to return. That guy was John the Baptist, and here he is doing that. He lays it all down for them. He was the opening act. They did all that. And here's what John the Baptist has, has to say. This is his account. Verse 6 says this. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. Bet you won't get that at the, at the mall. <laughs> for food, he ate locusts and wild honey, kind of like a mountain man. John announced, somebody is coming. The the real deal, the the main course, the the, the main guy who's greater than I am, so much greater than I am, I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave to untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water. But when he steps on the scene, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
John said, that's right, John said, don't even worry about me. Thousands of people are coming. And he said, there's a guy you need to be waiting for. So thousands of people were coming out of Jerusalem, out of Judea to hear John. John, is, he's the opening act. He's getting everything ready. He's baptizing people. And for Jewish people, the act of baptism, that wasn't surprising to them. That They had already had their, their washing rituals, their cleansing rituals. They, they do that anyway. But the fact that John was baptizing as a symbol as sins being washed away, that was different for them. That, that, that was totally different for them to understand that, that, that you can repent yourself. You, you don't have to go get a goat or a lamb or take it to a priest. Somebody didn't have to be in between you. No. John says the kingdom has arrived, and all you have to do is repent and change your life. And baptism shows that that's, that's been done. It's interesting. He's getting everything ready. And here John is. He called people to repentance. He even called out the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. John was like a, a, an evangelist running a, a tent revival at the Jordan River, baptizing people left and right, changing them. And John is saying this. He said, guys, I'm baptizing you with water, but when this man comes, he's going to do what water can't do. He's going to baptize your spirit. That's right. He, he's going to wash your spirit clean. Water can't do that, but the Holy Spirit can. The Holy Spirit can do that. And, and he preached this with passion. He called people to this. So, so the, the, the writer Mark, he's reminding the persecuted church in Rome about this guy, John the Baptist, and how he set the stage for Jesus to come. Mark doesn't record the birth of Jesus. He doesn't go into all that. Mark doesn't record in his gospel. He doesn't re uh, record the, the genealogy of Jesus' bloodline all the way back to, to, to David. He doesn't do They didn't have time to do that. He simply wants to get to the meat of the situation, that Jesus Christ is Lord and you can trust him and take it to the bank and cash the check and it won't bounce. <laughs> that Jesus is who he said he is. That's what Mark wanted to know. The original readers, they knew Jesus' stories. They just needed to believe and encouragement to stay with Jesus in the midst of their suffering. Church, you got to understand this. Many of us love the idea of Jesus. But sometimes we need encouragement to stay with him in suffering. We love the idea of Jesus, right? We love it. We love the idea of, of, of who he is. We love the idea of coming to church. But we need encouragement to stay with him in suffering. Church, I'm going to tell you this right now. That is something incredibly important for you to understand. Some of us, you get to the point in your life, like, okay, I'm going to go try this church thing out. Yeah, I'm going to go try God. You know, had a rough season. I'm going to go try church. Let me tell you something. You don't just try Jesus. He's not like clothes and, a, you know, a pants you try on at Walmart. He's not like that, okay? Either you are all in or you're not. It's so important. You just don't try him. Because to follow Jesus means to follow him in suffering. It, even if it means you got to lay down your own way and pick up your cross and follow him. It means to follow him wherever you have to follow him through. It, it means if family doesn't understand, it doesn't matter. We follow Jesus. It means if you got some day one homeboys, you got to let go. It's okay. It's fine because I'm following somebody that's more important. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Even if your family goes through some of the hardest situations that rock you to its core, to follow Jesus means to follow him even in the depths of your life because you know that on the other side of the suffering, there's something much greater. You know, you know that on the other side of the suffering is preparing you for something that you can't even imagine, the reward after so much greater in God's kingdom church and that's what we got to understand the first century church in Rome they had to worship Jesus behind closed doors they couldn't worship Jesus like this in the early church 100 AD 100 uh, 100 years after Jesus was there when the church was just getting started they couldn't worship Jesus like this they had to be underground because at any given point one of them could have been the next to have their head chopped off or to go into prison because of their faith so the apostles and the disciples and people like Mark had to write to keep the church encouraged through incredible suffering. Right? They had to figure all this out. They needed to be reminded that Jesus would be with them and that suffering is a part of this walk. Suffering for Christ is a part of what we do with him. We do this with him. And that is what Mark is focused on when he writes this gospel to remind the people that even when it's all said and done, all things will be made new. So he gets right into reminding the people about Jesus's ministry. And immediately after Mark starts talking about John the Baptist and all the things he talks about, 
He then goes into the story of how Jesus then comes to get baptized himself. Now, this is interesting. Go to this. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. The verse 9 says this. One day, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly beloved son, and you bring me great joy. The Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals, and angels took care of him. Man, that's amazing. That, those two things right there are two things that you got to understand, extremely important for us to see. These two events, Jesus' baptism and him going into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan, these, are, these were two separate events that probably happened months apart. But Mark is, is going quickly through his gospel. He has words like immediately and straightway and at once because he wants people to see these things. So here we are, we see Jesus himself coming to get baptized by John in the Jordan River. One of the reasons John is even baptizing in the first place is so he can reveal the, to the people who Jesus is. He's trying to reveal to the people that, that, that the whole reason people are there is to gather to them to see the main guy, right? So we can understand. So what we can under, And what we can understand from this scripture is that only Jesus saw the Holy Spirit descend on him and heard the, heard the Father's voice. Only Jesus and John. Now, we don't know for sure, but what we can surmise is that that was probably the case. Now, other people might have heard it. But what we see is this amazing event happen, the baptism of the Son of God. But the question is, why? Why is Jesus being baptized? He's not being baptized for the same reason me and you get baptized. He's not being baptized to show that you, your sins have been forgiven. That, that's not why he's getting baptized. Jesus is being baptized, number one, out of obedience to the Father. John actually came to Jesus and said, I, I don't know why I'm baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. Jesus said, no, no, no. The Father wants it this way. Well, one of the other reasons is to identify with the people he came to save. Jesus came here as a man. He came here as the God man. But also he came here to be our example. And if, and if our heavenly father sent his son and his son was also baptized as his followers, we should also be baptized. Not out of need but out of obedience. And I want to make this very clear. You do not need to be baptized to get saved. It's just an act. All baptism is, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of what's already been done in your heart. The most important baptism is what happens in your spirit when you place your faith in Christ. When you place your faith in Jesus, he washes you clean from the inside. I don't care if you're on the, on the side of your bed at 12 o'clock in the morning, morning. I don't care if you're at somebody's house. I don't care if you're right here on, on stage. I don't care where you're at. The moment you give your life to Christ, he baptizes your spirit and makes you clean. And his Holy Spirit can live in you. So John baptizes Jesus. This beautiful picture of the Father speaking to the Son, and here the Holy Spirit is descending on Jesus. It's, it's the stuff that pictures are made of that you see in these stained glass, right? It's beautiful. But it's interesting because that same spirit compels Jesus to go into the wilderness, to be tempted of Satan. What in the world is going on here? Like, what, what sense does that make? That here this, this spirit is that empowers Jesus is now compelling him to go into the wilderness to be tested of Satan. Why? I, I thought the Lord's prayer says, don't lead us into temptation. What, what is going on here? It's interesting. Because this would be the first defeat of the enemy of our souls. This would be the defeat of Satan right here in the wilderness. Jesus didn't wander into the wilderness and just the devil popped up. No, no. This was part of his mission to defeat Satan, to defeat Satan and his schemes. Jesus was showing us how to put on the whole armor of God. He was showing us what it means to use the word of God to fight our battles. The Holy Spirit will allow testing in our lives to develop us and to strengthen us. Not to kill you. It might feel like you're being killed, okay, but, it, but it's, not to, it's not to kill you. It's to make you stronger. Jesus is showing us as a human, as a man, how he defeated the temptation of Satan through the power of the Scriptures, through the power of the Word, how he, how he went through testing and went through it and came out perfect. He showed us this. We talked about this during our Christmas series, how Christ came here to be our example. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. You don't, have to, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read it to you. Hebrews 4, verse 14 says this. 
So then, since we have such a great high priest who's entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours, he understands our weaknesses. Why? Because he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Christ faced all the same testings you went through. All the temptation to go against God, all the temptations you have to do things your own way. Jesus endured the same thing the Bible said, yet he did not sin. He overcame it. And if you look at the Gospels, you can actually see, you know, how Jesus uh, took on and, and destroyed Satan's temptation with the word. And since Jesus lived in triumph over the enemy, we can too. It's not, don't think it's strange just because you're going through these things. Maybe, maybe you're going through something in your marriage with your parenting, with your kids, or on your job, or whatever it is. He says, don't think it's strange. Don't think it's strange at all. Whatever, whatever's happening to you, the same temptations to go against God, Jesus faced them, and he overcame them. And because he overcame them, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. When you live your life through Christ, you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Now, I want to make this very clear. I think it's a good place to put a disclaimer. There is a very big difference between going through testing that God allows and then living in the consequences of your own actions. I want to make it very, very clear. Those are two different types of suffering, right? It is not the same thing at all. Some of us are like, man, I'm already going through it in 2024. No, you're going through it because you didn't listen to God. You're going through it because you didn't take good advice. You're going through it because you wanted to do things your own way. You wanted to chase pleasure instead of the long-term commitments. That's why we're too worried about what other people think instead of what we really need. Every time you get a little bit extra money, instead of saving it and paying the bills, you end up, why, why the bill collectors collect it? You know, because we're at the mall every time we get a little extra money. We wonder why we're going through things in our relationships because we're chasing the wrong men or the wrong women, and we wonder why our hearts are broken. We wonder why, you know, we're still hanging out with the same old people that we used to hang out with in high school and wonder why we're not going anywhere because we're still there. We're wondering all these different things, right, because, because these are consequences of our own actions. It's a very big difference, very big difference between going through the testing that God gives and our consequences. But even in our foolishness, and we all got it, okay, God shows his grace and mercy that we can run to him when we have a sincere, humble heart. And he can get us back on the right track. Amen. That's the grace and mercy of God. So we see in Mark's gospel, how, Mark's gospel how Jesus conquers the temptation of Satan with the word of God. He conquers all of that. And now we move into this last section where Jesus calls his first disciples. And again, Mark is moving quick. It's a Netflix movie, man. It's going fast, going from this scene to the next scene to the next one. So check this out. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. What Mark says. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee. Jesus was like, okay, they're starting, to, they're starting to arrest people. I gotta get up out of here. Okay? It's not my time yet, Jesus is saying. When we pre he where he went to preach God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they followed him also, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Once again, we see in rapid fire, Jesus' ministry starting to develop. And we see this. We see how Jesus has the same message that John the Baptist has. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe. The, the kingdom of God is here. In the middle of the Roman Empire that had a chokehold on everything, Jesus is announcing that a new kingdom has arrived. A, a better kingdom has arrived. The time that God had planned, everything that the prophets were talking about is now happening and fulfilled. And to enter this kingdom, all you have to do is repent and believe. Right? Repenting means to change the way you think. It doesn't mean just to come here, come up, come up on stage and cry. It means, that, it means that we've changed our life. It means that we've changed the way we think. 
It means that that old life that we have, we realize we now need Christ and we need to believe. The, 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 the teaching of the kingdom, it was amazing. When Jesus was teaching about this kingdom, it, it stirred people's hearts so much that people like Simon and, and Andrew and James and John, the minute they saw Jesus, they followed him. If you look in the gospel of Matthew and Luke, it actually gives this a little bit more detail. Jesus was actually teaching on the shore and thousands of people like this, more people were following him. And he needed to step out on a boat so that he could teach them. And he uses Simon's boat. And here he is teaching the people. And he tells Simon, hey, Simon, thanks for letting me use your boat. Man, this is what I want you to do. Go out and launch your boat out a little further and go throw your net and go catch some fish. Simon's like, look, Jesus, check this out, man. I- I'm in the fishing industry. Now is not time to fish. I-, I know that, look, you're a preacher. I'm a fisher. I know the industry. Now is not the season. But you know what? I'm going to go ahead and do it. Simon Peter probably, man, the dude don't even know what he's talking about. Throws his net out there. And in a miraculously in an instant Simon catches more fish than he's ever caught in his life and he looks and he's amazed and he's like this makes no sense and he runs to Jesus gets down on his knees and says Lord I can't follow you I'm a sinful man Jesus says Simon let me tell you something that's nothing I'm gonna teach you how to fish for people and the Bible says immediately he left everything dropped his nets and followed Jesus Jesus showed Peter the kingdom of God. He showed him how as the king of the world, even nature has to listen to him. That's the power of God. And when they saw this, they believed and they followed him. Jesus was showing them this. They realized at that point that there was nothing more important on the planet than following the one who's in control of the planet. They believed. But let me tell you something. Following Jesus comes with a cost. I will say it again. Following Jesus comes with a cost. You can come to him just as you are. You can come to him however, wherever you're at. It doesn't matter how dirty, how crazy, it doesn't matter. You can come to him. But I will tell you to truly follow him, you will have to give up your own way. Pick up your cross and follow him. To, to truly follow him, you will have to give up something to truly follow him. We all have our idols. We all have our vices. We all have things that sit on the throne of our life that are extremely important. But to truly follow him, only Christ can sit at the throne of our life. To to truly follow him, we got to lay down whatever we think is more important and follow the king. Jesus said, you even got to love me more than your own family. These men saw the benefit of that following Jesus was so much greater than what they thought was important. He opened up so many doors for them. They left everything to follow him. Jesus even used their skills as fishers to bring more people into the kingdom. And we see how he continued to just change people's lives. Church, we see how the gospel of Mark shows us the power of the kingdom through Jesus. When the people who originally read this, when they were, when they were seeing this, they were going through suffering. And reading stories like this of their Savior helped them get through the suffering. It reminded them that Jesus is who he said he is. And I want to tell you this. As you go through 2024, I don't care how strong of a believer you are. You're going to get to a point in your life where you're going to need to be reminded that Christ is on the throne of your life. You're going to have to, at some point, put that faith into action. It's okay to talk about it. It's okay to come to service and smile and everything else. But at some point in your life, the rubber is going to have to meet the road, whether it's through suffering, whether it's through anything else. And you're going to have to place your faith in Jesus, remembering who he said he is. It's what he did for the early church, and that's what he's doing for us today. Now, we're going to continue to track through the book of Mark throughout this series. I got some homework for you. I know you're like, man, I don't want no homework. Scott. Yes, I got some homework for you. We're going to read Mark chapter 1. Go home sometime, uh, maybe, maybe on your lunch break at work, maybe in the morning. Read Mark chapter 1. Now, we actually read Mark at our first Bible study. Some of you were a part of that. Like, oh, man, we got to read it again? Yeah, surprise. We're going to read it again. <laughs> read Mark chapter 1. Also, jump into Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 17. Just see how Jesus starts changing people's lives. And we're just going to go through the Bible and just see what Jesus does. Dive into the Word of God so that it can dive into you and change your life. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you because you are the God we can trust and put our hope in. Lord, so much has happened throughout this past year, and who knows what 2024 has to hold for us. 
But God, I trust and believe that as long as you are at the foundation of our life, we can make it through. Lord, so many people have gone through suffering. Even right here through the scriptures that we've read, people have gone through the same things. But God, help us to know that as long as we keep you at the center, the storms can come, the winds may blow, but you'll keep us standing. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray.